Random numbers are a very useful thing to have. Why else would we have created dice to roll and coins to flip? We use random numbers to make decisions when there would be indecision, or when we need digital security. However, if you have studied random numbers, you may come to the conclusion that truly random numbers are very difficult to produce. In theory, you could calculate which way a group of dice will land based on a certain throw. The same applies to code, because it is meant to be predictable and output the same result every single time it is run. So, how is it possible for us to use code to generate these random numbers, even though the code itself is not random at all and is actually very predictable? And do the methods we use differ when using a microcontroller as compared to a desktop computer? Let's find out. Let's imagine for a second that we are the first people to ever write code to generate random numbers. How would we do it? Well, we would likely start out by creating an algorithm that seems almost impossible to reverse engineer. Ideally, the output would be very different every time it is run, otherwise the number isn't actually random. The simplest way to do that is just to use the previous output as part of the input of the next number in the sequence. That way, we can basically guarantee that the outputs will not be the same every single time. But how can we turn the input into an output so that it generates a number that is completely unpredictable? Well, for that, we can simply run a mathematical operation. Perhaps we can use multiplication of the two previous random numbers. Let's write a quick C program to test this idea. Remember, the algorithm will work by multiplying the previous two results together. So, let's say that the previous two were 3,074. So we should get a result of 239,000. The next call to this algorithm would be 239,000 multiplied by 3,000, which will get us an answer of 772 million. And we can keep doing this pattern for a while. This seems pretty good, and the numbers will eventually overflow back to zero based on the size of the integer being used. That is, it's pretty good until we actually get a result of zero. Then the algorithm returns zero forever. We could simply just add something to this algorithm to counteract the zeros. We could simply add 23, for example. Feel free to experiment with other algorithms yourself and create numbers that appear to be very random. And luckily for us, there actually is a very easy way to determine whether our code actually generates good random numbers. We can use a program called ENT, which will test how good our random numbers are. It simply runs several tests on the numbers that we generate. I will leave the link to the webpage in the description. You can also install it by using the AUR if you are running an Arch Linux based distribution. Anyways, we can utilize this program by either passing it a file full of our data or by feeding it data through standard input. I opted for the latter and piped 50,000 samples of our random data through. The scores are a bit confusing at first, but they're all useful in their own right. The entropy score should be as close to 8 as you can get it. The chi squared test should be close to 50% wherein the edges, like 0 0.01 and 99.99, are bad. The arithmetic mean value should be as close to 127.5 as possible, which is half of the 8-bit maximum. Monte Carlo value for pi should be close to pi, 3.14. And finally, the serial correlation coefficient should be close to zero. You can read more about all of these tests on the ENT website. Just make sure to input a lot of values to reduce the luck that's involved. If we take a closer look, we can actually see that the algorithm suffers from a repeating problem near the end. Anyways, the algorithm that we made isn't all that great, so we should try to find a better one to make better random numbers. With that being said, let's take a break from toying around with making our own algorithms so that we can take a look at one that is tried and true. The most famous random number algorithm is the LCG algorithm, or Linear Congruential Generator. The equation goes like this. The next random number is equal to the previous random number multiplied by a multiplier, and then added to an increment. The whole thing is then taken to a modulus. The modulus and the multiplier should both be greater than zero for obvious reasons. The multiplier and increment should also both be smaller than the modulus. Implementing the LCG and C results in good scores across the board, except for the chi square algorithm. Great, we can actually start using our random numbers. Well, almost. Everything that I've shown you so far in this video is not actually random. We've been dealing with what we call pseudo-random numbers. If you take a closer look, you'll realize that running our algorithms multiple times always results in the same numbers in the same order. Not so random after all. This is caused by what we call a seed. 
Normally, the next number in the sequence is generated with some previous input. The problem arises on the very first number though. Since there is not a previous value to fall back on, we need to come up with one ourselves. That means if someone knows the first value, the seed, then they know all future values. Pseudo-random numbers still have a use though. For non-critical applications, such as video games, the predictable nature of the generator doesn't matter because nothing is at stake and someone reversing the algorithm wouldn't be a serious problem. If you've ever tried a game like Minecraft, for example, you'd know that the seed determines which world the computer will generate. And inputting the same seed a second time results in the same exact world. Pseudo-random numbers are also very fast to generate. But what if you want a truly random number that malicious users should not know? For that, we will need a source of what we can call entropy, something so unpredictable that it is practically random. This entropy will assist in generating our seed. This is rather simple in desktop computers since we can simply use the key presses on the user's keyboard, or the movement of the mouse, or even what time the computer is turned on. Here you can see this in action for yourself if you are running a Unix system. Simply read the contents of slash dev slash random. Here, you will find a stream of random bytes that were created using the entropy that your computer found. This system is used for generating things like PGP keys. You'll notice that running GPG will prompt you to create entropy when generating a new key because it wants to ensure that your current key is sufficiently random to protect against attacks. In taking the output of dev random and placing it into ENT, we will find amazing scores all across the board. Quick side note. Running hex dump on slash dev slash random kind of makes you look like one of those Hollywood movie hackers. Anyways, while this is all interesting in theory, let's get close to the hardware and generate some of our own random numbers. To do that, I've pulled out this Atmega 328p microcontroller board. We can communicate between the PC and the microcontroller over a serial interface. I simply use this FTDI board to do so. Arduinos have serial to USB interfaces built in as well, so you don't have to worry about that if you're using an Arduino. Re-implementing the LCG algorithm from earlier, we find that we get the same numbers in the same order that we got in the PC version. And this would be good enough if you were implementing an electronic die, for example. But again, we are trying to get real random numbers. The most common way to collect entropy, it seems, is just to read an unconnected floating analog pin. This seems like a good idea, since it seems like the analog return value could be anything, especially since there's a lot of radio frequency noise all around us. The only problem with this is that the analog pin usually returns somewhat similar values despite floating. A way to counteract this is to read multiple floating pins, or just the same pin multiple times. Then you can add all the samples together to amplify the difference caused by the random interference. This way, you will get numbers that are more random with the cost of being slower, of course. The list of additional entropy generators could go on. Microphones, temperature sensors, noisy diodes, button presses, and even clock jitter. Basically, you just need to find something which is unpredictable to the point that nobody can reasonably reverse it or predict it. Okay, great. We have created a random seed, but there's still one problem. Somebody can still easily reverse the LCG algorithm if they knew a few random numbers in the sequence. So how can we overcome such a challenge? Well, the first thing we should do is combine multiple sources of entropy to make everything more unpredictable. So for example, we would say five floating analog pins in the value from a hardware timer. This makes it very difficult to piece together the seed at the start. The next thing we should do is mix up the seed every now and again. So we could randomly decide that after 10 seconds, for example, we should restart the random sequence with a new random seed. And finally, we need to separate the output from the generated numbers. What I mean by that is that we should hash the generated number and make it so that there is no easy way to determine the actual number the algorithm created, while still giving us a useful random number. And one of the most well-known hashing algorithms is the SHA-256 hashing algorithm. You may have heard of it from the Bitcoin blockchain. Basically, anything that we feed into it will produce another number. The best part about this, however, is that it is not easily reversible, meaning that you cannot easily take the output and deduce the input. That's why Bitcoin uses it, by the way. The miners must spend huge amounts of processing power just to reverse one hash. This is great, because by the time that an attacker cracks the algorithm and finds our seed, it doesn't matter, because we have already collected new entropy and switched over to a new seed.
Anyways, to implement it, I simply use this AVR crypto library from the user Cantora on GitHub. I will post the link to it in the description so that you can use it for yourself. Also, make sure to salt the hash as well, so it is harder to brute force. I salted it using the current value of the hardware timer. Using our new complete random number generator, we can generate some really random numbers. We can also capture the results and feed them into ENT, which also gives us some really good scores. Anyways, this may not be the most secure way of generating random numbers, but it is certainly 100 times more random than the pseudo-random numbers that we generated at the start of this video. There's also one more thing that I would like to mention. Some microcontrollers make generating random numbers quite easy. We had to go through the design process for the AppMega 328P because it doesn't provide any hardware random number generation. However, some more expensive microcontrollers, such as the ESP32, have onboard random number generators. Using them is trivial as well. All you have to do is access the random reg32 memory location and you'll get some very good random numbers. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video and now understand how computers can generate random numbers. If you did enjoy, please consider subscribing so that you can see my other videos. Have a good one!